They say one man's trash is another man's treasure. In the year 1771, Charles Messier would publish 45 of the objects in what is now known as the Messier Catalog. By 1784, this number would increase to 110. Charles had been tasked by the king at the time with finding comets. Perhaps comets served as an omen of sorts that could sway the direction the kingdom was going. And, while Messier was a splendid comet hunter, what we mostly remember him for these days is his Messier catalog. He created this catalog so that he would not be fooled by diffuse objects in the night sky that could be mistaken for comets. In short, to him, these objects were in the way and were mostly uninteresting. We know today, though, that these are possibly some of the coolest things out there. The objects in his catalog include star clusters, other galaxies, and nebula which is what we're going to be covering here today. Now you might ask, what exactly is a nebula? Broadly speaking, a nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust found in space. The materials found in nebula can vary depending on their age, location, and other physical conditions. To give some examples of this, one nebula may be mostly composed of hydrogen while another nebula may contain helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as well. The gas and dust found in nebula can also become ionized. When an element is ionized, it has either lost or gained electrons, which can lead to the emission of light at various lengths in the electromagnetic spectrum. This can lead to the various characteristic colors and patterns we often see in a nebula. The composition, structure, and other features of nebula make them a fascinating topic of study for both astrophysicists and astronomers, since they offer important clues about the history and evolution of our universe. Not all nebula are the same either. They can be roughly broken up into four main types, which we will be getting into next. The first I would like to go over today are known as emission nebula, also sometimes known as stellar nurseries. My favorite example of this being the Orion Nebula, which you may have heard me talk about before as a star forming region. Another prominent example of this are the Pillars of Creation, which can be found in the Eagle Nebula. In these regions, the formations of gas, dust, along with other materials, begin to clump together, forming denser regions. The density attracts other matter and eventually becomes dense enough to create the formation of stars. The remaining material is believed to form planets and other objects in a solar system. It is very likely that this is how ours was created as well. Another feature of an emission nebula is that its gases are ionized and thus often emit radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum. This helps make them some of the brightest nebula in our sky. The Orion Nebula, which I mentioned earlier, is the most active star forming region in our galaxy and is visible even to smaller backyard telescopes. It is one of my favorite and preferred objects to show off whenever I'm at a star party or at the observatory. Just as stars are given birth and formed, like many things, they too eventually die. And in death, they can create different forms of nebula. Two of our previously mentioned examples come from this. The first of these are known as planetary nebula. I was at a star party recently with my backyard telescope, and one of the objects I pointed it to is the ring nebula. This and other planetary nebula are formed when a star dies and, in the process, creates dramatic formations of radiating cosmic gas. Some other examples to go with this one is the helix nebula and 
the Dumbbell Nebula. These are caused by low mass stars, meaning they are not the ones that go supernova. And when they enter the final stages of their life, they expand into what is known as a red giant. In this phase, the star slowly loses its outer layers due to helium flashes from the interior. As the star loses material, its temperature increases. The ultraviolet radiation that is emitted ionizes the surrounding material that has already been thrown off. On top of this, the gas is also moving outwards at a tremendous speed, roughly between 10 to 30 kilometers per second. Our sun will eventually undergo this as well, meaning that it too may one day create its own planetary nebula. And this leads us into our second example. We have determined now that a low mass stellar death can lead to the formation of nebula, but what about high mass stars? The ones that do end up going supernova. Let's take a look at the Veil Nebula, a remnant of a star that went supernova roughly 8,000 to 10,000 years ago. This nebula is rather large, spanning 110 light years. The star that created it was about 20 times as massive as our sun, and the sort of explosion that causes this type of nebula often leaves behind a remnant in the form of a compact object, such as a neutron star. The fast moving blast wave from this ancient explosion is plowing into a wall of cooler, denser interstellar gas, which is in then emitting the light that we can see. So far, we have talked about nebula that are emitting their own light, but there is also a kind of nebula that is dark, and we can only see it because it is backlit by bright areas of interstellar material behind it. These are known as dark nebula. Opaque clouds that do not emit visible radiation and are not illuminated by stars within them. Though they are sources of infrared radiation due to the dust found there. One such example of this is the Horsehead Nebula. This nebula is composed of thick clouds of dust that block the bright emission nebula gas that's behind it. This is what allows us to see it, and it really just might be the most iconic dark nebula out there. Our ability to study things like nebula really picked up with the advent of two technologies. Taking photographs, sometimes known in the form of astrophotography, and this is because it really helps to reveal the faint details that are otherwise just invisible to the naked eye. It also provides a permanent record of the observation for further study at a leisurely pace and by multiple scientists. This effectively caused a revolution in our understanding of nebula. The first photo of the Orion Nebula was taken in the year 1880, but we would not really get good photos of it until three years later. We learned a lot from these early photographs as they revealed details that were unsuspected by visual observations alone. The second technology is the study of the physical nature of astronomical objects like nebula by viewing their spectrum in what is known as spectroscopy. I have spoken on this in past videos, but basically it lets us determine the chemical composition of an astronomical object by recording and studying the wavelengths of light it both absorbs and emits. This is really what helped us begin to split galaxies apart from nebula. We can do this because stars pretty much radiate all wavelengths, while hot transparent gas clouds radiate only emission lines at certain wavelengths, which are characteristic of their constitute gases. In 1864, observations made of the spectrum from the Orion Nebula showed bright emission lines of glowing gases with conspicuous hydrogen lines and some green lines even brighter than that. Galaxies, on the other hand, were found to be stellar in nature, as they're comprised of 
many, many stars. Hence the now known distinction between galaxies and nebula. While for Charles Messier, nebula were among the objects he cataloged to avoid, for us today, they are among the most exciting objects in our night sky. Both for professionals when it comes to studying and learning more about our galaxy and universe, and also for amateurs for telescope viewing and backyard astrophotography. If you would like to learn more about galaxies, another object found in Messier's catalog, then please check out my video right here. I hope you've learned something, and let's all step outside tonight and look towards the stars.